I'm Al Feldstein. Back in 1984, and again in 1988, I published my historic postcard albums of Garrett County. Even though I had thousands of copies printed, each of these books sold out in a little over one year. Since that time, a lot of people have asked me, Al, why don't you do a new book on Garrett County? Well, I wanted to do something different, something that had never been done before in Garrett County. As a result of that, you're about to see a comprehensive videotape that depicts hundreds of historic sites, scenes, and landmarks within Garrett County for your viewing pleasure. And so you don't have to watch the entire two hour videotape all at once. I've divided the production up into six chapters. We begin with Oakland. We then move to Mountain Lake Park, Deer Park, and Lock Lynn. Chapter three covers all the other towns and communities within Garrett County. Grantsville, Friendsville, Jennings, Kitzmiller, Shalmar, Bloomington, all the other little towns and communities that make up Garrett County. Chapter four is Deep Creek Lake, and we visually review the history of that area. Chapter five covers the National Road, and along with that, we talk about Braddock's Trail. And the sixth and final chapter covers all the rest of Garrett County, the B-52 Memorial on Route 40, Meshack Browning's gravesite, Muddy Falls, and dozens and dozens of other scenes. I certainly hope you learn something from this videotape, but more than that, I want you to enjoy it, and I want it to be a pleasurable viewing experience for you and your family. With that said, on with the show. It was in January of 1872 that a number of residents from the western portion of Allegheny County sent a petition to the state legislature requesting the creation of a new county. Advocates of a new county cited as their three main reasons for this initiative, the substantial distance from far western Maryland to the existing county seat in Cumberland greater representation in the state's General Assembly, and greater opportunities for local tax revenues and more appropriate expenditures of public funds. Two possible names were proposed for the new county, Garrett and Glade. Acting in compliance with this petition, a new county was established by the Maryland State Legislature on April 1st, 1872. Named after John W. Garrett, then president of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, Garrett County was formed from the western section of Allegheny County and has the distinction of being the last county created within the state of Maryland. It was a constitutional requirement, however, that the final ratification of the county's creation be left up to the qualified voters of the territory. To this end, the question concerning the creation of a new county, as well as the people's choice for county seat, were both voted on in the November 4, 1872 general election. Voters overwhelmingly approved creation of the new county by a vote of 1,297 to 405. The popular choice of the electorate for the county seat was Oakland, which won out over rivals Grantsville and McHenry's Glades, the former by only 63 votes. On December 4, 1872, Maryland Governor William Pinckney White proclaimed that the extreme western triangle of the state has become and is now constituted as a new county to be called Garrett County. Oakland was formally declared the county seat by the state legislature on March 10, 1874. In 1880, the first Garrett County Census showed a population of 12,175 people. The county would owe much of its eventual development to the building of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad through its mountains in 1851-1852, and which traveled east to west through the southern end of the county for a distance of 30 miles. Earlier development and settlements were the result of such transportation breakthroughs as the building of this nation's first and only totally federally funded and constructed highway, 
the national road between 1811 and 1819. The National or Cumberland Road, as it was often called, passed through the northern portion of the county for a distance of over 20 miles. It's 1915, and I'm taking life easy at Oakland, Maryland. Designated the county seat on March 10th, 1874, Oakland had settlements dating from the early 1800s when the land was first patented and named the Wilderness Shall Smile. Subdivided and laid out in 1849, Oakland was formally incorporated by the state legislature on March 10th. 1862. Main Street, 1943. The sender of this postcard writes, Dear Mary and Will, the air up here is wonderful. We sleep under two blankets every night. I feel much better than I did before. Love, Aunt Lizzie and Mary. Note Warnick's restaurant on the right. Second Street, 1953. That's Carol's sports shop on the left. Main Street, now 2nd Street, about 1914. The Garrett County Courthouse was designed by New York architect J. Riley Gordon and built by W.A. Leller, contractor and builder from Kaiser, West Virginia. Erected between the years 1907 and 1908, the courthouse actually had its cornerstone laying ceremony on October 15, 1907, and it is the second courthouse to have served the county. Major alterations and additions were made upon the Garrett County Courthouse between the years 1977 to 1979, significantly changing its historic appearance. The writer of this postcard in 1947 writes, Dear Irene, no dear yet, it is hailing so hard up here now I dare not attempt the roads home. The Garrett County Jail and Sheriff's Office, which originally included the sheriff's residence, were designed by the architectural firm of Hombo and Lafferty from Clarksburg, West Virginia. The facilities were constructed in 1905 at a cost of $35,981. This 1913 view shows where they stood at the rear of the courthouse. The sheriff's office and jail were both demolished during the courthouse renovations in the late 1970s. In 1949, Aza Stanton designed and created this birthday cake on the Garrett County Courthouse lawn celebrating the city of Oakland's 100th birthday. This postcard, published in 1914 by W.A. Gonder of Oakland, depicts the Garrett National Bank building. The Garrett National Bank was originally organized in 1888 by a group of Oakland businessmen under the name the Garrett County Bank of Oakland. This was the first bank established in Garrett County. In 1903, a charter converting this institution to the Garrett National Bank of Oakland was issued. The original bank building was constructed on 2nd Street and opened for business on November 14, 1888. The second floor initially served as an apartment for bank officials. The bank building was later enlarged and substantially modernized. This 1940 postcard depicting the Garrett National Bank was published by Hamill's Stationery and Bookstore in Oakland. The structure is now referred to as the professional building on 2nd Street. The J.W. Jackson Company 5 and 10 cent store in Oakland, nothing over a dollar, about 1950. Ward's Restaurant, about 1952, I believe. Main Street, about 1907. The building on the right at the corner of 2nd and Alder Streets is the First National Bank of Oakland. This bank received its charter on November 15, 1900. The bank building depicted in this postcard was constructed in 1903 
and opened for business in November of that year. By the way, on the left is the Bonton and Confection Shop of W.A. Gonder. A wonderful view of Railroad Street from the early 1900s. This postcard is dated 1920. Another view of Railroad Street from 1910. Guests staying at the Hotel France, depicted in the middle, could go next door for a fine meal in the restaurant or have dessert at the ice cream parlor, all the while just waiting for their train at the Oakland Depot, which stands in the background. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad established its first station in Oakland upon the railroad's arrival in 1851. The station, which stands in Oakland today, was built by the B&O in 1884 and was designed by the Baltimore architectural firm of Baldwin and Pennington, who between the years 1870 and 1896 were hired by the B&O to design most of its stations. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Station in Oakland represents a superior example of the English Queen Anne architectural style. The following series of postcards were published by Bonton and Confectioner W.A. Gonder of Oakland. Main, later 2nd Street, in 1911. Notice the original Garrett National Bank building second from the right. Main Street, later known as 2nd Street. The building on the right is the newer, substantially remodeled Garrett National Bank. And beyond that is the Offutt store, which at that time was advertised as the largest general merchandise store in Western Maryland. The Offutt building was constructed about 1899 and remains standing on 2nd Street today. Through the years, it has been known as Fraley Store, the Kaufman Fisher Company, and Rudy's Store. Main Street. On the left, the Oakland Auto Supply Company featuring Kelly Springfield Tires. On the right, the First National Bank of Oakland. 1912, 2nd Street. 2nd Street. Most sources indicate that the old Oakland schoolhouse at the corner of Center and Wilson Streets was constructed in 1894-1895. The school was built at a cost of $12,512.45, with money believed to be originally earmarked for teaching. This was due to a school construction bond issue being voted down, and as a result, the school term that year ended after just eight weeks. In 1922, this, the elementary grammar school building was badly damaged by fire, but was soon rebuilt and remodeled. In 1910, high school classes were relocated from this schoolhouse to the old Garrett County Courthouse, which had been built in 1877. Several years later, in 1918, the Oakland High School was constructed, which in its construction incorporated the former courthouse decorative brickwork and elements of the colonial revival architectural style are evident. This building, the old Oakland High School, now serves as the Garrett County Board of Education. This postcard, published by the journal Stationery Store in Oakland, depicts the S. Lawton and Son store and garage on 2nd Street. 1947, 2nd Street featuring Gonder's cut-rate store, lunch and soda shop, and on the right, the First National Bank. Need cigars, cigarettes, ice cream, and candy? You can always get them along with a meal at the Green Palm Restaurant. Your hostess, Mrs. Victoria Ingram. With its cornerstone laid in 1940, the U.S. Post Office facility, which serves Oakland, was constructed at a cost of $80,000. It is typical of the classically inspired buildings erected by the federal government during this period. St. Mark's Lutheran Church, depicted in this photograph, was built in 1906 on 2nd Street. It replaced an earlier structure on the corner of 3rd and Alder, which was destroyed by a fire in 1905. 
This St. Mark's Lutheran Church building was raised in 1976 with the construction of the present church edifice. This postcard, published by Hamill's Stationery Store in Oakland, depicts St. Peter's Roman Catholic Church on 3rd Street, which was built of stone in 1902. This 1908 postcard depicts the former St. Paul's Methodist Church, which was dedicated on September 27, 1891, at a cost of $7,700 and which stood on the site of the present church parsonage. Part of this building was raised and the main portion relocated to the corner of Oak and 4th Street, where the church was remodeled, enlarged, and incorporated into the present St. Paul's Methodist Church, which, as depicted in this 1944 photograph, was constructed of brick and dedicated on April 5, 1936. Construction began in 1868 and was completed in 1869 on what is today known as St. Matthew's Episcopal Church. Known for many years as the Garrett Memorial Presbyterian Church, this edifice was built by members of the Garrett family, including John Garrett, as a memorial to their brother Henry. Several presidents, including Grant, Harrison, and Cleveland, have worshipped here. The church has, since 1939, been operating under the congregational auspices of St. Matthew's Episcopal Church. This photograph is dated 1912. The stone St. Matthew's Church is the best example of the Gothic Revival architectural style in Garrett County. The sender of this card writes, December 15, 1910. My dearest daughter Maybell, slaying and snowing, a regular blizzard of weather, your father, D.H. Shanneman. Shanneman stayed at the Commercial Hotel, which was opened by S.M. Miller on 2nd Street in Oakland during the latter part of the 19th century. The Commercial was later enlarged and became known as the William James Hotel. Cool nights, warm days. Phone Deerfield 43317, the William James. The rest was a large three-story house which served as a summer hotel and was located on 7th Street, corner of Alder. Shown in this 1910 photograph, the rest would undergo several changes in ownership, management, and patronage prior to its being sold in 1934 and remodeled into apartments. The Oakland Hotel was erected by the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad in 1875 to share in the success of the area as a summer resort. It was designed for the B&O by the Baltimore architectural firm of Baldwin and Pennington. This magnificent hotel was built of wood, was 131 feet long and four stories high. It featured a ballroom, a large dining room, and even a children's dining room. One of its guests included Alexander Graham Bell, who in 1883 installed the first telephone line in Garrett County. This spanned five miles and connected the Oakland and Deer Park hotels. The hotel, which initially had 110 bedrooms with 82 added on later, was closed in 1907 and raised in 1911. The historic Washington Spring with its Perry-style roof laid adjacent to the path through the Oakland Hotel Grove. There, guests and visitors at the Oakland Hotel used the waters and spring location to have picnics or just sit on the benches. The spring received its name because General George Washington once stopped here to quench his thirst on September 26, 1784, while on a trip over the mountain. In 1989, the town of Oakland purchased the old hotel grounds, thus acquiring the spring, and with the help of the Maryland Conservation Corps is restoring this historic landmark. The Manhattan Hotel building was originally constructed in 1896 on the corner of 2nd and Oak Streets by Mrs. Harriet McCloskey. There were several owners of the Manhattan during its operation. In the early morning hours of May 14, 1956, a fire struck causing over $20,000 in damage. 
the building was raised soon afterwards. Notice the automobile garage in the rear used for guests of the Manhattan Hotel. In the heart of vacation land, an early view of the Motel Oakland, located on 3rd Street, US Route 219. 18 units, tile baths, Simmons Beauty Rest Springs and Mattresses, phone Oakland 2-2602. A 1930s view of Liberty Street looking towards 2nd Street. In the background, the J.W. Jackson 5 and 10 cent store, while above that, the Garrett County Courthouse. The building on the right with a Maytag sign hanging in front was the A.D. Naylor building, which was constructed on Liberty Street in 1899. It was destroyed by fire in 1975. The Queen Anne style home, Seelheim, is one of the most elaborate houses constructed in Garrett County. Large and rambling and built sometime between the years 1898 and 1904, Seelheim is significant not only because of its architectural quality, but because it was the homestead of Henry Weber, a nationally prominent pioneer horticulturalist. Second Street, Oakland, about 1915. Several magnificent homes representative of the colonial revival style of architecture. 1910, the Queen Anne style residence of Harry Sinsel on North 2nd Street. The sender of this postcard writes, how many times have we passed this beautiful house on our numerous walks to Oakland? The residence of Daniel E. Offit on 2nd Street, who owned the largest general merchandise store in Western Maryland. Daniel Offit also served as president in the 1888 Garrett County Bank Incorporation. In 1912, the sender of this postcard wrote, I just arrived with a cyclone. It was something awful. Hope I may never experience another thing like that. This place doesn't look like this photograph now. Everything is blown down or broken. Some sources state that the Offit House depicted here was constructed in about 1870. Oak Street, July 25th, 1909. Dear sister, came to Oakland today. It is a beautiful mountain town. Attended high mass. Love to all, Kate. December 7th, 1948. The Pickwick Inn or Hotel of Oakland was opened in 1945 and located beyond 7th Street on Alder in a large colonial revival style home built in 1908 by G. Sims Hamill Jr. Flood to Miss Virginia White staying at the Maryland Hotel in Lonaconing, July 28, 1912. Dear Virginia, hope you are feeling better today. Our town looks terrible. Love, Max. Second Street, Oakland. The uniform rank of the Knights of Pythias are on parade. On December 14, 1909, the sender of this postcard writes, went for a ride the other evening, didn't get a bit cold as the wind was at my back and the buggy was covered. We are all well except Virginia, who has chicken pox. Third Street, Oakland, May 30th, 1925. The Ku Klux Klan on parade. Located in the background are the meeting rooms of Proctor Killed Outpost number 71 of the American Legion, which was organized in Oakland in 1920. The Oakland Golf Club, Oakland, Maryland. Originally a nine hole course, the back nine opened in 1937. In 1966, the front nine opened, making the Oakland Country Club golf course an 18-hole course. The A.D. Naylor Company has its genesis from 1884 when Alonzo Drake Naylor established a blacksmith shop in Oakland. Over the years, Naylor's has evolved into a hardware and contracting business. In September 1975, a major fire destroyed the A.D. Naylor building on Liberty Street, which had been constructed in 1899. The new A.D. Naylor & Company hardware store in Oakland, depicted in this photograph, 
was opened in October 1977. In 1915, people were being very well cared for in Oakland, Maryland. The young man who sent this card to a friend in Frostburg writes, the Frostburg State Normal team played basketball here Saturday night and beat Oakland. Do you know any of their team? Signed, Lloyd Castile. In 1881, four prominent men from Wheeling, West Virginia, bought 800 acres of land between the town of Oakland and the resort of Deer Park, which had already been well established by the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Their purpose was to establish a Chautauqua-type resort. Founded upon Christian principles, where ministers, educators, and lay leaders of the church could be trained and study in an environment of high moral tone. They called it Mountain Lake Park, with the lake to be constructed at a later date. Mountain Lake Park, located one mile east of Oakland, was founded and organized in 1881 by the Mountain Lake Park Association. This was composed of clergy and laymen, primarily of the Methodist Episcopal Church. Taken at a conference in Mountain Lake Park, this is a 1910 photograph of the executive committee of the layman's missionary movement of the Methodist Episcopal Church. Laid out in 1882, Mountain Lake Park was noted for its 35-acre lake and more than 200 cottages and houses. This is a view of G Street. Although the town would not be officially incorporated until 1931, Mountain Lake Park had, by the turn of the century, become a well-known and popular resort. This postcard features on the left the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Depot for Mountain Lake Park. Above it and across the tracks, the Loch Lynn Hotel, while in the center, the hotel's recreation building. More about all of these later. In 1894, a new boathouse had been built on the lake, which itself had also been enlarged to 35 acres that same year at a cost of $11,300.29. Another view of the new boathouse. On August 11, 1908, the sender of this postcard writes, Dear Eve, haven't tried the lake yet, but expect to in a short time. I'm still tickled to the point of tears. Love, Edith. In 1906, a combination bowling alley and billiard parlor was constructed. It was built alongside a boardwalk which had been constructed from the bowling alley to the post office down by the railroad tracks. This photograph of the bowling alley and billiard parlor also depicts a sign promoting the 800-acre Mountain Lake Park community. About 1944, this building was turned over to the town of Mountain Lake Park and currently serves as the town hall on Allegheny Drive. The bowling alley portion in the rear was relocated elsewhere in the town for use as a private residence. Along the boardwalk was Pilgrim's Rest. Within this rustic setting, travelers along the boardwalk could sit and read their mail or simply talk theology. By 1900, at least nine hotels existed within the community. The Mountain Lake Park Hotel, the central portion of which was constructed in 1882 by J.M. Jarbo of Oakland, would by the turn of the century double in size. For many years, excellent accommodations, service, and cuisine characterized this fine hotel, which was also the scene of many important social functions. The hotel remained open until the early 1960s. Its furnishings were sold at public auctions in 1966. The Mountain Lake Park Hotel was eventually demolished in 1968. The Braythorn first opened to guests in 1897 and at one time could accommodate 50 persons. In 1912, room and board ranged from eight to $12 a week. Considered to have been one of the last large summer hotels in Mountain Lake Park, the Braythorn ceased to function in that capacity about 1940. The Braythorn featured a high mansard roof 
representative of the Second Empire architectural style. It stood at the corner of G Street and Route 135. The Braythorn was raised several years ago. This view is dated from about 1909. The rest home for deaconesses actually consisted of two large houses located on the northeast corner of Spruce and H Streets. The second house from the corner was constructed first in 1882 by the Reverend John Thompson. Upon his death in 1898, the house and property were purchased for $2,500 and turned into a rest home for deaconesses of the Methodist Church. The second house, the corner building, was built about 1900 and was for some time known as the Burlington Hotel. This was purchased and connected to the original Thompson Rest Home by a porch and dining room in about 1917. The properties are now privately owned. The first public building in Mountain Lake Park was the Assembly Hall or Tabernacle, which, as shown in this 1908 view, was constructed during the spring and dedicated in 1882. It was originally used for classes and meetings by organizations which met at Mountain Lake Park during the summer. The Mountain Lake Park Assembly Hall or Tabernacle Building has recently been restored to its original appearance by the Camp Meeting Association which funded an extensive restoration project. The original auditorium as seen in this 1912 photograph was attached to the assembly hall and burned in 1941. Another auditorium collapsed from the weight of snow in the late 1960s. The current auditorium seats 350 people and is primarily used for religious functions. The Allegheny House, as seen in this 1909 view, might well have been the first boarding house in Mountain Lake Park, having opened for business in 1882. The Baldwin Cottage, located on N Street, was built by a Cumberland minister, Dr. Charles Baldwin, during 1882-1883. He was a founder and longtime president of the original Mountain Lake Park Association. This postcard view is from 1906. The amphitheater, or auditorium, as depicted in this 1907 photograph, was constructed in 1899 and dedicated in the spring of 1900. It was over 170 feet in diameter, had a seating capacity of almost 5,000 persons, and a stage which could accommodate several hundred people. It was built to accommodate the ever-increasing Chautauqua crowds and hosted such notable figures as William Howard Taft, William Jennings Bryan, Mark Twain, and Billy Sunday. The amphitheater was architecturally noteworthy because there were no interior posts or supports to obstruct the view of the audience. This was accomplished by way of exterior supports around the structural perimeter, which were connected to a complex webbing of roof beams and rafters. By the way, I believe the banner hanging in this 1908 photograph reads, Let us keep the Heavenly Father in our midst. In 1939, the amphitheater's use was discontinued. By 1944, the structure was in a dilapidated condition and posed a fire hazard. With no one to assume responsibility for its maintenance, the amphitheater was raised in 1946. On the right, the eight-sided ticket office which served the amphitheater, which was to the rear and built into the hill the ticket office as it appears today. The Straw Bridge Meeting House. The Faith Home, Mountain Lake Park, 1907. The Faith Home was located on Deer Park Avenue and was one of the area's earlier hotels. The Faith Home later became known as Hamilton Hall and as seen in this 1926 photograph, went on to serve Mountain Lake Park for many years. Briar Bend, a seminary school for girls established in 1887. 1912, the Hotel Chautauqua. The Columbian Hotel, as seen in this 1907 depiction, was located on Deer Park Avenue in Mountain Lake Park. This large three-story hotel was gone by the early 1920s. 
August 2nd, 1911. The Arnold Cottage, Mountain Lake Park. Like all of the park's boarding houses, the Arnold was a very respectable cottage where the meals were most likely served promptly at 8, 1, and 6 o'clock. Major Burns Cottage, possibly on Deer Park Avenue, 1910. The sender writes, the Bible conferences have just closed and were a real treat. The Chautauqua opens today. Wish you were here. The wooden frame Baltimore and Ohio train station for Mountain Lake Park was designed by the Baltimore architectural firm of Baldwin and Pennington. Early photographs such as this one from 1910 show that the station once had a square tower with a bell cast roof similar to the brick b &O station in Oakland. Now occupied by various shops and boutiques, this is a recent trackside photo of the station. A 1924 postcard depicting Crystal Spring at Mountain Lake Park. Aunt Alma writes, this spring is at the head of the lake. I have walked down there two or three times. Crystal Spring, some say, was widely known for its pure water. The old post office at Mountain Lake Park, which stood along the tracks near the train station. Although trains provided mail service to Mountain Lake Park, house-to-house -house mail service would not be instituted until 1962. Prior to that time, a trip to the post office was a daily routine. August 5th, 1932, the entrance drive to Mountain Lake Park. Cozy Row, 1929, by the way, Electric arc lights were installed in Mountain Lake Park in 1894. E Street. Another view of Cozy Row on E Street. If you want to sin, go to Loch Lynn. For Jesus' sake, go to Mountain Lake. Loch Lynn was originally founded as Lakeview on April 1st, 1882. Upon its development in 1894 and subsequent name change to Loch Lynn Heights, it would provide much of the pleasures, such as dancing, which were forbidden across the tracks in the adjacent Chautauqua religious community of Mountain Lake Park. This 1908 photograph depicts Loch Lynn, which was officially incorporated by an act of the Maryland legislature on April 4, 1896. The Loch Lynn Heights Hotel, as seen in this 1913 postcard, was constructed during the years 1893-1894 and opened in the summer of 1895. The sender writes, Dear Pearl, I've just spent four days here. It was real fine. The Loch Lynn Hotel featured a ballroom in the main building and was truly a magnificent resort facility. The sender of this 1909 postcard writes, did not forget you, but oh my, this is so lovely a place you can hardly find time to write. The Lachlan Hotel was destroyed by fire in September 1918. The large frame building which stood near the Lachlan Hotel was known as the Casino. This recreational facility featured a casino, bowling alley, billiards, card rooms, and a 15 by 40 foot heated swimming pool. The casino or swimming pool building, as it was also known, was the last surviving remnant of the area's great summer resort hotels. It was demolished during the summer of 1987. One of the very fine homes of Loch Lynn in the early 1900s, Dundee Hall. The town of Deer Park is located about six miles east of Oakland. There are two explanations, both of which are accurate, as to how the town received its name. The first is that the area was given the name prior to the French and Indian War because the region was a reputed resort for wild deer. A second explanation is that in 1870, Henry Gassaway Davis and John W. Garrett enclosed 10 acres of land at this site for a deer refuge. 
Although a post office was established at Deer Park as early as 1864, its real growth began with its development as a summer resort by the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. The Swiss Alpine-style Deer Park Hotel, which was built in 1872 under the watchful eye of John Work Garrett, was officially opened on July 4, 1873, and initiated John W. Garrett's efforts to develop the area as a resort community. The hotel was situated on the route of the B&O Line on the summit of the Allegheny Mountains, 2,800 feet above sea level. The original Deer Park Hotel consisted of 104 rooms, parlor, dining room, children's dining room, reading room, laundry, bakery, kitchen, and servants' quarters. In a separate building was located a billiard room and four bowling alleys. Later, two swimming pools, a music pavilion, golf course, and clay tennis courts were provided. Carriage rides over the 500 acres of ground, known as Peace and Plenty, and as seen in this 1909 photograph, were also provided to hotel guests. The Deer Park Hotel became so successful that in 1881, two annexes were added which doubled the hotel's accommodations. This view of the Deer Park Hotel complex as seen from one of the annexes is from 1927. By the 1920s, the B&O had already discontinued direct management and ownership of the hotel, and in 1929, then owner Henry S. Duncan lost title to the resort in the stock market crash of that same year. It never reopened after 1929. Tennis anyone? Prior to its demolition for lumber and war material in 1942, the Deer Park Hotel played host to such guests as Presidents Grant, Harrison, Cleveland, and McKinley. This view, dated August 22nd, reads on the back, It's freezing up here. We have a fire and are still cold. Everything has frozen. Love, Betty Lou. The dining room at the Deer Park Hotel. 1912. Waitresses at either the Deer Park or Mountain Lake Park Hotel. The postcard states that all but two of these girls are college students. Can you guess which ones? Boiling Spring near Deer Park was first developed by the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad in 1873 and to this day is known as one of the finest springs in the country. At the time of this 1909 photograph, the water from Boiling Spring was being served in the dining cars of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, as well as the dining tables of the Deer Park Hotel. Years later, it would be served upon Pan Am's international flights. 1911, the summer house on the grounds of the Deer Park Hotel. The sender writes, the weather is wonderful up here. I feel so much better now. It's the 1905 summer season, and the Deer Park Orchestra is assembled. This is the town bandstand at Deer Park, and is the only remaining community bandstand within the county. Afternoon concerts in the town parks were a pleasant summer diversion in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. A personal note, as a young man, my father traveled from Cumberland on a regular basis to play in the Deer Park Orchestra, of which he was a member. 1912, the Deer Park Inn, E. H. Smouse Proprietor. Rosemont, the residence of Colonel J. T. McGraw. The sender of this postcard, dated 1910, writes, This used to be the house of Senator Davis. I like it. Love, Lottie. Church Street in Deer Park, August 25th, 1910. Cleveland Cottage, Deer Park. On June 2nd, 1886, President Grover Cleveland was married in a beautiful White House wedding in Washington, D.C. The next day, he and his bride arrived at this Deer Park Hotel Cottage where they spent their honeymoon, which lasted about 15 days. From a view dated 1908, this Deer Park Hotel Cottage 
is believed to have stood directly behind the hotel and close to the barn and stables. Though not definite, several people feel this may have been the manager's cottage. The shingle-style Pennington Cottage was built in the late 19th century as one of the numerous cottages which served the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad's Deer Park Hotel complex. The large three-story cottage features a gambrel roof and deep wraparound porch along the front facade, which is covered entirely with dark wood shingles. The cottage was designed and built around 1892 by Josias Pennington of the Baltimore architectural firm Baldwin and Pennington. Josias used the cottage as a summer home. In recent years, Pennington Cottage has served as the Deer Park Inn, a delightful restaurant and bed and breakfast. I have some pretty warm work, but I like it in Grantsville, Maryland. In 1915, the center of this postcard writes, this is some place. In 1785, Daniel Grant of Baltimore patented his 1,100-acre cornucopia and moved to his property on the Braddock Road. When the Cumberland or National Road was built, the original village site was abandoned and new Grantsville relocated along the new highway. This particular view is from 1908. The town we know today as Grantsville owes its early settlement to the development of a national road in the early 1800s. In 1822, a post office was established under the name of Tomlinson's at Little Meadows. In 1834, the name was changed to Little Crossings and in 1846, finally to Grantsville. The town of Grantsville was incorporated in 1864. The Castleman Hotel, as depicted in this 1907 photograph, is located on Main Street in Grantsville. The Castleman was built in 1824 by Solomon Sterner. This historic landmark, which has served travelers along the National Road for over 160 years, has also been known at various times through the years as Sterner's Tavern, the Drover's Inn, the Farmer's Hotel, and Dorsey Hotel. The Castleman remains probably the oldest hotel on Route 40, which has stayed in continuous operation to this day. The Castleman, as seen in a postcard published by the Leo J. Beachy Mount Nebo Photographic Studio in Grantsville. The sender writes, you recognize this picture? Where the cross is, is our room. This is a fine picture of the old Sterner house. In summertime, vines cover the porch nearly all over. Love, Sister Alice. In 1837, Henry Fuller of Salisbury, Pennsylvania moved to Grantsville. In 1843, he constructed the original portion of what came to be known as the National Hotel. The National Hotel was one of several inns and taverns built along the National Road during the 19th century. This photograph, postmarked 1909, identifies C.A. Bender as the proprietor. This is a much later view of the National Hotel, taken from a card published from 1941. The gas pumps in front were obviously a premonition of things to come. Raised in about 1984, the site of the National Hotel is now occupied by this commercial enterprise. As depicted in this Leo Beachy photograph, the Castleman River Bridge was constructed in 1813 and with an 80-foot span was at the time of its construction the largest stone arch bridge in America. It was reportedly made longer than necessary in hopes that the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, which was originally proposed to extend to the Ohio River, would pass beneath it. The Castleman River Bridge was built by David Shriver, Jr., superintendent of the National Road. Skeptics felt that the arch would collapse once the supporting timbers were removed. As legend has it, 
Superintendent Shriver had the key supporting structure quietly removed the night before the public opening. He stood beneath the bridge and proclaimed that he might as well be dead if the bridge collapsed. The bridge stood. The bridge has served as a major link for the movement of goods to and from the west over the National Road and has been used continuously from 1813 to 1933. Its steel structure replacement was built in 1932 by the Maryland State Roads Commission. The first state bank was founded in 1910 and had rebuilt its Grantsville Bank Building, pictured here in 1920. The first state bank merged with the Liberty Trust Company of Maryland in 1960. In 1967, this building was donated by Liberty Trust to the Board of Library Trustees of Garrett County. This edifice, which is representative of the neoclassical commercial architecture, is now the Grantsville branch of the Ruth and Lowe Library. A 1906 view of the Victoria Hotel. With Emmy Bevins, the proprietor, the Victoria Hotel was considered a popular stopping place for tourists traveling the National Road. It was especially noted for its home comforts and was considered one of the newer types of hotels which were replacing the old tavern stands and inns. This is the Mill Grain Building at Stanton's Mill. Constructed about 1900, the purpose of this building was simply to provide for grain storage. Stanton's Mill, located on Route 40 at Grantsville, dates back to 1797 when Thomas Stanton conveyed a deed to Jesse Tomlinson for water rights to run a grist mill on Indian Springs Run, the present site of Stanton's Mill. This was the first mill in the Little Crossings area on what was then known as the Little Yakagani, now the Castleman River. The Stanton Grist Mill was rebuilt in about 1859 on the foundations of the earlier late 18th century mill. This five bay, two story structure provided wheat, buckwheat, flour, animal feed, and sawn lumber for the Grantsville community. The mill property was returned to the Stanton family during the early 1860s and in 1989 was purchased by Penn Alps and is presently being restored. John Friend Sr. is considered to be the first permanent white settler in what is today known as Garrett County. The settlement which he and his brothers and their families established in 1765 on the Yakagini River was on land purchased from the Indians and as legend has it, for the price of one large iron cooking kettle. For some time, the site was known as Friends Fortune. It is today known as Friendsville. The large white building in the center of this photograph is the Riverside Hotel. The church building on the far right was constructed in 1921 as the first ME Methodist Episcopal Church. Built of a distinctive yellowish-orange brick, it is now the Friendsville United Methodist Church. The Riverside Hotel was constructed about 1905. It is located on Water Street facing the Yakagani River and served as a hotel until about 1914. Still visible and painted on the second floor exterior are the words, Riverside Hotel, W.B. Collier Proprietor. Maple Street, Friendsville, from a card dated August 27, 1910. 1916, Maple Street. A post office had been established here as early as 1830 and was called Friends. In 1832, the post office department changed the name to Friendsville. The first National Bank building of Friendsville was constructed about 1910. Located at the corner of Maple Street and First Avenue, it later served as the town hall and library. On August 3rd, 1985, this building became the national headquarters and museum for the Friend Family Association of America. Looking west on Maple Street, on the left, H.L. Wolf's store and the Friendsville Drug Company, while on the right, in the background, just before crossing the old bridge, 
the Central Hotel. Maple Street looking east across the old Maple Street Bridge. What's that old sign say over the bridge? $5 fine for driving or riding over this bridge faster than a walk. It's a good thing the Maryland State Roads Commission constructed this new Yakagini River Bridge in 1932. This postcard is symbolic of accident, which became a German settlement composed of many Pennsylvania Dutch families. In 1774, the proprietor of the Maryland colony, Lord Baltimore, opened his lands westward of Fort Cumberland for settlement. In that same year, a 682-acre tract of land was surveyed for one William Deakins, Jr. No sooner had the survey been completed than Brooke Bell arrived on the scene and claimed that he had previously selected the same track for his survey and called attention to his ax marks on the tree to prove his claim. Land was abundant and both men were friends, so the issue was easily resolved. But the circumstances which led to both men claiming the same land led to the track and subsequently the town being named Accident. Accident, Maryland, looking southward from the center of town, much as it may have looked in 1914, the postmark of this card. That's the Linden Hotel, halfway down the street on the left. John Robinson, I believe, is the proprietor. This photograph depicts the paving of Accident's Main Street, also in about 1914. The town was officially incorporated in 1916. The original survey track of land known as Accident was eventually resurveyed, incorporated into a larger track known as Flowery Vale, and sold to one Colonel William Lamar. It was Lamar who brought his sister, Priscilla, along with her husband, James Drain, to settle here in about 1801. The Drains were the first permanent settlers at accident, and this was their home. The Drain House is the oldest standing house in Garrett County and stands on the eastern limits of accident. It is a combination log and frame structure which consists of two sections. The larger section was probably erected by Colonel Lamar sometime prior to 1800, while the smaller portion was built by the Drain family in about 1803. This structure is currently being restored. Cortez H. and B. Worth Jennings began their Garrett County lumber industry and timber activities on August 17, 1899, with the purchase of three tracts of land totaling over 6,000 acres. Although the ridges bordering their purchase along the Castleman River were abundant in timber, transportation posed a key problem. To remedy this, the brothers planned a standard gauge railroad south from Elk Lick, later known as Salisbury, in Pennsylvania. The mill, as depicted here, was constructed near the junction of Big Laurel Run and the Castleman River. With the rails laid in 1901, the Jennings Brothers Railroad followed the south branch of the Castleman River, southward almost to its source on the north slope of Meadow Mountain for a distance of over 30 miles. Logically enough, the center of all this activity was named Jennings. The town had many homes, a hotel, a church, a school, and a company store, the Jennings Supply Company, which is portrayed in this 1907 photograph. In 1918, the mill closed. The railroad, however, remained and soon lent itself to the transport of coal. The Jennings Church was constructed in 1909 by Charles Ingle and built primarily from molded, rusticated concrete blocks. This was an unusual building material for a church located in a town at the center of the county's lumber industry. The molded, decorative concrete blocks and elaborate designs on the frieze of the church feature laurel wreaths, rosettes, cartouches, and rope 
molding. This church is the best example of this particular architectural style in Garrett County. The Methodist Episcopal Church at Jennings, as it appeared in a photo postmarked 1910. The cornerstone of the present day Jennings United Methodist Church on Hare Hollow Road, which I believe basically remodeled and engulfed the original structure with a modern cut stone material, reads as follows. Cornerstone M.E. Church, July 1909. Presented by J.B. Williams and Company, Marble and Granite Dealers, Frostburg. Rivaling Jennings in size and production was the nearby lumber community of Davis. The town was developed by J.B. Davis, a well-known lumberman from Somerset County, Pennsylvania. Davis bought much timberland in the county during the late 1800s and began his formal operations in March 1913. The Davis site was located on a flat parcel of land north of Maryland Route 495 near the junction of the south branch of the Castleman River and the Castleman River. A single band sawmill, store, post office, and 20 laborer homes comprise the community, much of which is evident in this view displaying the town of Davis. Operations ceased about 1917 or 1918, and with the last house raised about 1960, little evidence remains today of the community's existence. An early 1900s view of Bloomington, located at the confluence of the Potomac and Savage Rivers at the base of Backbone Mountain in Garrett County. The town was originally laid out on June 17, 1849, and in the words of the surveyor, consisted of 39 lots near the mouth of the Savage River at the Potomac in what was then Allegheny County. He called it Bloomington. The post office at Swanton, Maryland, August 4, 1911. A post office at Swanton was first established in 1862. The community's growth began when the B&O passed through in 1851. Swanton developed during the 1880s and early 20th century as one of the railroad's lumber shipping points in the county. This is the old Swanton Hotel, or Lure House, as it was commonly known, a Victorian-style frame edifice which was constructed about 1880 and faces the B&O Railroad tracks. The Swanton Hotel accommodated the B&O Railroad's telegraph operators and travelers unable to stay at the more luxurious hotels at Mountain Lake Park, Loch Lynn, and Oakland. The old B&O Railroad Station at Swanton, most likely built in the early part of this century. It is said that the town of Swanton was actually named in honor of Thomas Swan, who served as president of the B&O from 1849 to 1853. Gormania, West Virginia, and its sister town across the Potomac River, Gorman, are both named after United States Senator Arthur Pugh Gorman. Senator Gorman was a stockholder in the West Virginia Central and Pittsburgh Railway. This railway in 1881 succeeded the old Potomac and Piedmont Railroad, which had been formed in 1866 by Congressman and eventually U.S. Senator Henry Gassaway Davis. The purpose of both railroads had been to develop the rich coal and timber resources of the Potomac Valley. The small company towns along the railroad line were actually named after Senator Davis's colleagues, such as Senator Gorman, who were stockholders in the railroad, which was oftentimes referred to as the Senatorial Railroad. This 1908 photograph depicts the Western Maryland Depot at Gorman. The West Virginia Central and Pittsburgh merged into the Western Maryland system in 1905. A 1947 depiction of the old U.S. Route 50 Gormania Bridge, which was constructed in 1938 and crossed the Potomac River connecting Gorman, Maryland to Gormania, West Virginia. Vindex was once a thriving early 20th century coal company town, which by 1920 boasted a school, church, company store, and 500 persons. West Vindex 
adjacent to Route 38, is still home to at least a dozen families. This photograph is of East Vindex, several miles east down Vindex Road along Three Forks Run. The last coal mine here was shut down in 1950, and these ruins, most likely that of the company store, and the nearby ruins of a company once consisting of 75 homes are the classic example of a coal town gone bust. Kempton, located at the southwestern tip of Garrett County, was a coal town founded in 1913 by the Davis Coal and Coke Company. This company operated the Kempton Mine here, which until its closing in 1950, was at one time considered one of the most modernly equipped coal mines in Maryland. The ruins of an old mid 20th century coal tipple, which now stands abandoned at Kempton. By 1918, the town of Kempton boasted over 850 residents and 106 homes. The houses were frame, two stories and four to six rooms each. Kempton thrived in the 1920s and had electric lights, paved streets, sidewalks, a movie theater, school, car dealership, and on the West Virginia side, a company store and opera house which contained a multitude of recreational facilities. There was a class system to some extent with the mine foreman living on Front Street and the workers, immigrants in some cases, residing on the back streets which, as depicted in this photograph, rose along the mountainside. With the coal mine's closure in 1950, most of the jobs were lost. All that remains today are about half a dozen homes and remnants of the past. Nothing but ruins remain of the Buxton and Land Street Company store, which once served Kempton. The company store was actually just across the state line in West Virginia. Some say this was due to a state law passed in 1868, which prohibited coal company-owned stores to operate within Maryland. Just below Kitzmiller, on the north branch of the Potomac River, another company town, Shalmar, was founded by the Wolf Den Mining Company, which began operations here in 1917. Wolf Den was later renamed the Shalmar Mining Company in honor of its president, W.S. Marshall. The company store depicted here was constructed in 1920 by the mining company. It was built of locally cut stone which was laid by Italian workers which the company brought in to Garrett County. The door on the right led to the pay office where workers would receive company script for purchases in the company store. The door on the left opened into the store and post office. The company store closed here in about 1948. The company store in Crellin was erected in 1896. This large frame building served a community deeply tied to the county's coal, timber, and railroad heritage. First known as Sunshine, Crellin takes its name from Roland P. Crellin, who led the Preston Lumber and Coal Company here in 1891. From 1905 until 1925, the Kendall Lumber Company and later the Stanley Coal Company would all eventually establish operations here and maintain offices in this building, which for some time also housed the community post office. The town of Kitzmiller was incorporated in 1906 and is located on Route 38 just across the Potomac River from Blaine, West Virginia. It's 1912, and all the good folks in Kitzmiller send you a kiss. As noted on this memorial, which stands on West Main Street, Thomas Wilson III established a grist mill on this site in 1802, thereby establishing the first industry in what is now Kitzmiller. The town name, at one time Kitzmillerville and later Kitzmiller, comes from Ebenezer Kitzmiller, who married Thomas Wilson's daughter, Emily. Ebenezer also founded a woolen mill and shirt factory here in 1853. Kitzmiller was early on known as a mill town located on the north branch of the Potomac River. 
Construction of the railroad in the early 1880s, which paralleled the river on the opposite side from Kitzmiller in West Virginia, marked the beginning of Kitzmiller's era as a lumber town, with coal mining beginning in earnest in about 1897. Between 1900 and the late 1920s, most of the economic livelihood of Kitzmiller depended upon the mining and transport of coal. Along with mining tragedies, the disastrous flood of March 29, 1924, washed out the Potomac Valley Pee Wee Coal Company, which had it opened in 1907 and nearly destroyed the rest of Kitzmiller. In the middle of this photograph stands the old Blaine West Virginia Railroad Depot, while in the background stands Kitzmiller's movie emporium, the Maryland Theater, which was raised as part of the flood control construction effort. The Browning Hotel, Kitzmillerville, about 1906. Union Street, Kitzmiller, 1908. The sender of this postcard writes, I can't get no postcard of the whole town at present, but we'll send you one soon. This here shows where I came over from Blaine, West Virginia. See you soon, love, Henry. Prior to the new bridge being constructed one block west in 1955 to cross the river into West Virginia, the center of town was Union Street. That's the old post office on the right while right next door is the J.B. Cormany Harness and Shoes Shop. The town band was apparently giving a concert this fine day. Union Street today. The building on the left was constructed about 1900 and was known as the Kaufman and Fisher Store. It is one of the area's oldest remaining commercial structures. At the end of the block, at the corner of East Main and Union Street is the former Kitzmiller Bank. This two-story brick bank building was constructed in 1912. Much of the interior, including the teller's grill window, remains intact. Also on Union Street and across from the Kaufman and Fisher store is the old one-story false front Kitzmiller Community Library. Kitzmiller could never really be classified as a company town. Its industries were varied through the years, and most of the homes were owned by the residents. This is the old Kitzmiller Grammar School. Built in the 1880s, the school now stands abandoned on West Main Street. In 1921, the Yakagani Hydroelectric Corporation, a subsidiary of the Pennsylvania Electric Corporation of Johnstown, was granted the exclusive rights by the Maryland General Assembly to investigate the possibilities of utilizing the Yakagani River and its tributaries for the purpose of generating electricity. At one point, it was thought that the entire project should consist of four dams and three powerhouses. However, only the Deep Creek Dam would be constructed. By 1923, the company had acquired over 7,000 acres of land and 140 farms at an average price of $55 per acre. Construction began on the Deep Creek Dam and Lake on November 1, 1923, under the supervision of the Conservation Department of Maryland. Nearly 15 miles of highway were relocated. 12 miles of railway were laid between the B&O at Oakland to the dam and powerhouse sites, and two steel bridges were built over the lake, which began to fill on January 16, 1925. The 1,300-foot-long, 86-foot-high dam from bedrock to the top of the dam created a lake 12 miles long with a shoreline of almost 65 miles and an area covering over 4,000 acres. The spillway depicted in this photograph under construction is 300 feet wide by 200 feet long. The elevation or crest of water at the top of the spillway wall is 2,462 feet. 
The three-story Pennsylvania Electric Power Plant was constructed in 1923 and began operations on July 6, 1925, serving customers in western Pennsylvania. The plant, as seen here, is located on the east side of the Yakagini River, about one-half mile southwest of Hoy's Run. That's the yak in the background, and on the far right are some of the company homes which belonged to what was then known as Deep Creek Village. This is an interior photograph of the power plant. That's Peter Boslin, an electrical operator at the controls. This photograph from about 1928 depicts the tunnel gate at the Deep Creek Dam. Water drawn from Deep Creek Lake passes through a 6,600-foot tunnel to the powerhouse where it is generated into electricity. Deep Creek Lake was purchased in 1942 by the Pennsylvania Electric Company, Penelec. The lake and buffer strip are, however, leased to and managed by the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. This is a view from Deep Creek Bridge looking south. A photograph from May 3, 1925, depicting the new bridge which had just been constructed over Deep Creek Lake. The Deep Creek Bridge was fabricated in 1924 by Bethlehem Steel of Pennsylvania for the Pennsylvania Electric Company. Its installation followed the damming of Deep Creek Lake in 1925. In 1986-1987, a new bridge was constructed to carry U.S. Route 219 across the lake. And the old Deep Creek Lake Bridge, as shown here in 1928, was removed shortly thereafter. The Glendale Camelback Bridge across the lake is a double-span steel mesh deck bridge which was constructed by the McClinic Marshall Company of Pittsburgh in 1924. The Glendale Bridge is presently a one-lane bridge across the lake. It is approximately 14 feet wide and 512 feet in length. Discussions are currently underway for its replacement. Motorboat rides at Deep Creek Lake. The Glendale Bridge appears in the distance to the right. A diving board, a bench, and an inner tube. I hope this fella has a dock permit. Sailing on the lake. Stop and eat at Cabin Lodge, a well-known and popular eatery on Deep Creek Lake. I wonder what the temperature was on the old mail pouch thermometer. Located on U.S. Route 219 on the shores of beautiful Deep Creek Lake. Dine in our fireside dining room. Open year-round. There's always something cooking at Cabin Lodge. This Deep Creek Lake landmark burned down in about 1962. The state highway at Deep Creek Lake as it looked in the early 1940s. It's the 1950s and we're at a picnic grove at beautiful Deep Creek Lake. Roadside picnic areas dotted the shoreline and were available without charge to passing motorists. A Ruth Van Morrow photograph depicting the construction of Route 219 South, adjacent to Deep Creek Lake. Road work and construction on Route 219 occurred here between the years 1961 and 1965. June 1955, Will-O-Wisp Motel. The sender of this card writes, well, here we are after waiting all these long months since last year. It's as nice as ever. Plenty of fishing and swimming. See you soon, love Ruth and Dutch. P.S. Dutch has a boat rented for our stay. August 1970, Will-O-The-Wisp Resort. The most complete vacation spot on beautiful Deep Creek Lake. Motels, cottages, dining room, and a complete line of recreational facilities. Try our Playhouse Buffet every Wednesday. Your hosts, Mr. and Mrs. Helmut Heiss. The Heiss family had purchased Will-O-The-Wisp in 1943. At that time, it was simply a collection of summer cottages on the shore of Deep Creek Lake. The Heisses added a small hotel and restaurant shortly after the purchase. 
The Point View Inn is one of the earliest and still existing businesses on Deep Creek Lake. And as this photo shows from the 1950s, it has long been a popular destination point for those tourists seeking rooms or handsome cottages as shown here. The current Point View Inn facility was constructed during the spring of 1973. The Deep Creek Lake Bridge. A very early, possibly late 1920s or early 30s photograph depicting a pioneer hospitality spot on Deep Creek Lake. The Rainbow Inn featuring meals, rooms, sandwiches, etc. August 16th, 1950, Deep Creek Lake. Speedboat rides, just 50 cents, or a dollar if you're an adult and want a longer ride. In the late 1970s and very early 1980s, this sign boasted of Deep Creek Lake as being Maryland's best kept secret. Today, 10 years later, the same sign boasts of Deep Creek Lake the Four Seasons Vacation Place. Make sure you all pick up a tourist map and do try to get in a round of miniature golf. In about 1751, Thomas Cressup began to survey and locate a trail west from a point near what afterwards became known as Fort Cumberland at the confluence of the Potomac River and Wills Creek. The trail, no more than a pack horse path actually, was to extend to the Monongahela in 1753. Cressup was assisted by the Delaware Indian Nemecolon, and the trail took his name, Nemecolon's Path. It was this trail, Nemecolon's Path, which was used in 1753 and again in 1754 by George Washington to first warn and then enforce British demands upon the French to leave the Ohio Valley. It was in 1754 that George Washington widened the path to six feet. George Washington's defeat at Fort Necessity in July 1754 began the French and Indian War. On June 10, 1755, British General Edward Braddock, an officer in the Coldstream Guards, left Fort Cumberland on his ill-fated march toward Fort Duquesne, now Pittsburgh, to wrest it from the French. To a very large extent, the trail Braddock used was the one first blazed by Nemecolon and Thomas Cressop. It was the Braddock Expedition in 1755 that is credited with widening and improving the trail to a width of 12 feet, thus developing its service as a major route westward until the nearby National Road reached the Monongahela River in 1817. Braddock himself met defeat at the hands of the French and Indians at the Battle of Monongahela on July 9, 1755, just 10 miles from Fort Duquesne. On July 13, Braddock died from his wounds and was buried the next day with George Washington delivering a eulogy. The trail he took to his defeat became known as Braddock's Road. Four of General Braddock's encampment sites used during his march to Fort Duquesne are located within present-day Garrett County. These include the Savage River Camp, located on the western slope of Little Savage Mountain. This was Braddock's third camp on the march. The route, later known as the Old Braddock Road, passed to the southeast of the National Road. A captain in Braddock's army wrote in his diary, we entirely demolished three wagons and shattered several descending Savage Mountain. In later years, this site was known as the Henry Blocker Farm. Little Meadows was Braddock's fourth camp. It was here during a council of war that it was determined General Braddock and a detachment of 1,200 lightly encumbered regulars would move forward while the remaining force would advance slowly with the heavy baggage, stores, and artillery. 
The fifth encampment was located about two miles west of Little Crossings. Little Crossings received its name from George Washington when he crossed the Little Yakagani, now called the Castleman River, with General Edward Braddock on the march to Fort Duquesne. Braddock's sixth encampment on the march was Bear Camp, about one half mile south of the Maryland-Pennsylvania boundary at Oakton. The preceding postcards, as well as this view of the summit of Big Savage Mountain, and the following depictions of Braddock's Road are the work of Ernest K. Weller, a Washington, Pennsylvania photographer who in 1908 and 1909 accompanied and photographed Professor John Kennedy Lecoq's expedition retracing Braddock's march. This is the Lecoq expedition on St. John's Rock, Big Savage Mountain. St. John's Rock has an elevation of 2,900 feet and stands about one-fourth mile northwest of Braddock's Trail. The rock was very popular in the late 19th century when such lookout points were visited by travelers. St. John's Rock overlooks Frostburg. Kaiser's Ridge in 1908. This part of the old Braddock Road presented the most difficulty with its thick underbrush, rocky terrain, and difficult mountain passes. Pusley Run, where nearby the old Braddock Road recrosses the National Road on Negro Mountain. Isn't that a wonderful rhododendron specimen? A scar or trace of the old Braddock Road at Spiker Run near Grantsville. Negro Mountain. In 1908, the scar from Braddock Road was still quite visible. In 1785, George Washington, as President of the Union, advocated the development of the Braddock Road into a national highway. However, it would not be until 1806 when the United States Congress authorized a road, the National Road or Cumberland Road, as it was often called, to be built from Cumberland to the state of Ohio. In March of that same year, President Thomas Jefferson appropriated $30,000 for survey work. Construction began at Cumberland in 1811, and by 1818-1819, the road had been completed to the Ohio River at Wheeling. The National Road would, by 1840, stretch across Ohio and Indiana to Vandalia, Illinois. It would eventually reach St. Louis, Missouri, the western terminus. This portion of the National Road between Cumberland and Wheeling is the nation's first and only totally federally funded and constructed interstate. For the most part, the National Road lies southeast of Braddock's Road, Nemecolon's old Indian path. In the 1920s, a national system of highways and numbering was initiated, and in 1926, the National Road became part of US Route 40. U.S. Route 40, Meadow Mountain, from a photograph postmarked 1934. In 1965, construction of the National Freeway, originally designated Route 48, was initiated. And between the years 1974 and 1976, the Garrett County portion of the freeway had been completed and opened. On August 2nd, 1991, with the final missing link in Allegheny County completed, Governor William Donald Schaefer announced the opening of Interstate 68, successor to Route 48, successor to Route 40, successor to the National Road, successor to Braddock's Road, successor to Nemecolin's Path. That's George Washington, by the way, congratulating Governor Schaefer. Let's look at some of the scenes along the old National Road, U.S. Route 40. High Point Camp, top of Negro Mountain, time to fill up with some Amico gas. An earlier view of High Point Camp, highest point on the National Road east of the Mississippi, elevation 2,908 feet. The name Negro Mountain, by the way, comes from the early pioneer and settler Thomas Cresset. According to Scharf's History of Western Maryland, long ago in the mid-18th century, Thomas Cressop and his black body servant, Nemesis, were pursuing a band of Indians who had attacked a settlement. 
they pursued the Indians over the Savage and Meadow Mountains and finally engaged them on the next mountain. Fighting bravely at Cressop's side, Nemesis was fatally wounded and buried on the mountain, which has since borne the name of his race. Big Savage Mountain, altitude 2,850 feet. In the background, Anton's Big Savage Inn, a popular restaurant on Route 40. This postcard is dated October 1970. Anton's Big Savage Inn, two miles west of Frostburg. Delightfully cool in summer, steam heat, and famous for home-cooked meals. Telephone, Frostburg 884. Anton's Big Savage Inn again, shown here in an earlier view when it was known as the Big Savage Hotel, burned down sometime, I believe, in the early 1970s. Buckeye Lodge atop Negro Mountain. Eat and sleep here. We have free campsites. A quick look at Buckeye Lodge as it appears today, 28 miles west of Cumberland. The site was also known as the old Cleveland Ashby service station on Route 40. Happy Hills Farm, five miles west of Frostburg, featuring home-dressed meats and good food. A closer look at Happy Hills Farm. By the way, folks, they've got ice cream and souvenirs, too. These cast iron mileposts were placed along the National Road between Cumberland and Wheeling in 1835 when the states took over the responsibility of maintaining the National Road. At that point, the National Road became known as the National Pike and was maintained by tolls. The cast iron mileposts replaced the earlier original milestones, which had become damaged and broken. These mileposts, eight of which still stand in Maryland, not only told the traveler how far it was to the next town, but also how far along the national road he had come and how many miles to the end. The Meadow Mountain Inn on U.S. Route 40, 1929. Another view, the Meadow Mountain Campsite, elevation 2,850 feet, just three miles east of Grantsville. Talk about your choice of gasolines. Among the brands we have here are Sinclair, Amico, Golf, Fire Chief, American, and Sunoco. The Meadow Mountain Inn also offered these lovely cottages. Or if you preferred a cabin, the Meadow Mountain Inn would also have these to choose from. A later view of the Meadow Mountain Inn. Apparently, the selection of gasoline had narrowed down by the time this photo was taken. The old tavern stand on Two Mile Run, five miles east of Grantsville. The tavern stood in an area known as Shades of Death, the most dreaded passage on the old Braddock Road, now Route 40. Dense forest of white pine once covered this region and gave favorable shelter to attacking Indians and later highwaymen robbing stagecoaches and murdering travelers along the National Road. This 1909 view of the old tavern depicts a farmhouse which later became part of Turner's Dairy. It was torn down in August 1990. Just three miles east of Grantsville, in an area known as Little Meadows, is the old stone house, also known as the Tomlinson Inn. As depicted in this 1908 photograph, the stone house was built by Jesse Tomlinson along the National Road in about 1818. Local field stone was used to construct the inn, and the work was primarily done by slave labor. The Tomlinson Stonehouse Inn was the political and community center of the area during the National Road's heyday between 1820 and 1850, when stagecoach and freight traffic was at its heaviest. Jesse Tomlinson was also a well-known postmaster and state legislature. His old stone house was one of the earliest inns on the National Road, served as a post office between 1822 and 1834, and not only hosted James K. Polk on the way to his presidential inauguration in 1845, but also President-elect William Henry Harrison, who stopped here for a rest in 1841 while on the way to his inauguration in Washington. 
the old Tomlinson Stone House Inn exists to this day as a private residence. The Fuller Baker Log House, also on the National Road about one mile west of Grantsville, was built around 1815 and may have served as a tavern. It stands on land which was at one time owned by Thomas Johnson, the first governor of Maryland. The log house, which is believed to be the only log tavern remaining on the National Road between Cumberland and Wheeling, is named after two early Grantsville area settlers. On your left, the old Stanton Grist Mill. And on the right, the Dixie Tavern on the National Highway, from a postcard dated 1926. The Dixie Tavern, now known as Penn Alps, was originally known as the Little Crossings Inn and constructed by Jesse Tomlinson in 1818, the year the Cumberland or National Road reached Wheeling. From 1818 to 1862, it was operated as an inn or tavern, first by Tomlinson and then other proprietors. The tavern was a favorite stop and served up to 14 stagecoaches per day. In 1862, the log tavern was purchased by William Stanton, remodeled to a large extent, and used as a private residence until inherited in 1924 by the Blocker family. The Blockers operated the Old Inn as a tavern and hotel restaurant, entitling the establishment the Dixie Tavern. The Blockers eventually sold the property, and in 1959, then known as the Arlington, it was purchased by Penn Alps Incorporated, and a major restoration effort was undertaken. A National Road Stone Arch Bridge located at Stanton's Mill near Grantsville. This single span bridge was most likely constructed about 1813 or 1814. It crosses the mill race in Indian Springs Run. That is the Stanton Grist Mill in the background. Five miles west of Frostburg, the new Colonial Inn and Cabins. We serve home-cooked meals, soups, and pies. Let's fill her up with Esso. In 1949, the sender of this postcard from the Colonial Inn writes, remember this place where we had a good chicken supper? Love, Chester. Snowbanks at Kaiser's Ridge, elevation 2,881 feet. Another view of Kaiser's Ridge. The big snow of April 29, 1928. The Mountain Inn Hotel atop Big Savage Mountain is in the background. Once again, April 29, 1928. The big snow atop Big Savage Mountain, elevation 2,880 feet. A 1924 postcard view atop Negro Mountain. Many of the postcards appearing in this video focusing upon the National Road and Grantsville area are the historic and creative legacy of Leo J. Beachy. Beachy's photo of the Castleman River Dam at Grantsville. Crippled from the age of 14, Leo Beachy lived his entire life in the Grantsville area and maintained his residence at the family homestead, Mount Nebo. Long stretch, looking east on the National Road by Leo Beachy. Beachy also took the name Mount Nebo for his photographic studio, which he built upon the family grounds. Creating his first photograph in 1901, Beachy would, until his death in 1927, produce quality portraits and postcard views documenting Garrett County life. Dependent upon family and friends to transport him to the sites he wished to photograph, Beachy would eventually leave behind almost 3,000 glass plate negatives. Beachy's depiction of the historic Little Crossings Dam on the Castleman River. A March 3, 1923 postcard depicting Beachy's photograph of the great old stone bridge and the National Road. It's our good fortune to have many of Leo Beachy's views depicting the National Road represented in this video.
This sign, which stands along Interstate 68 at the top of Meadow Mountain, denotes the Eastern Continental Divide. In simple terms, all rainfall runoff, drainage, streams, and rivers on the western side eventually flow into the Mississippi River and onto the Gulf of Mexico. Drainages on the east flow to the Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. The Eastern Continental Divide actually snakes its way through Garrett County at a distance of about 43 miles. The Negro Mountain Fire Tower, west of Grantsville, elevation 2,908 feet. The gravesite of Meshach Browning, born 1781, died 1859. Meshach Browning settled in an area generally known as the Sanging Ground, later called Sang Run. He authored a popular autobiography entitled 44 Years of the Life of a Hunter. He was Maryland's most noted hunter, having killed over 2,000 deer and 500 bear, as well as hundreds of wildcats. The Yawk River Oil and Gas Company was incorporated in Oakland in 1906. Stock was sold to drill a well at Hutton, which eventually turned out to be dry. This photograph from 1908 depicts the oil drilling rig at Hutton, Maryland. The Castleman River Trust Bridge along River Road near Grantsville is a style of bridge which dates back to the 1840s. This particular structure is most likely from about 1900. The bridge rests on cut stone piers. It is single span, made of steel, and has a wooden deck. Harrington Manor State Park within Garrett State Forest takes its name from an English gentleman who owned and operated a large plantation, estate, and manor house in this area. The development of the recreation area at the park began in the 1930s when, with the aid of the Civilian Conservation Corps, a 53-acre lake was developed as well as numerous cabins. The bathhouse depicted in this photo was also erected on the beach during this period and constructed of local stone. The sender of this 1950 postcard writes, we are really enjoying Harrington Manor and are in cabin number 13. It's very cool at night. We'll be having a weenie roast down at the Picnic Grove this evening. Bear Creek near Friendsville, Maryland. The mountain paradise of Swallow Falls State Park lies along the Yakagini River between Swallow Falls and Muddy Creek Falls. The park received its name, as legend has it, because in pioneer days, great flocks of cliff swallows dwelled here. A 1908 view of the Yakagini River below Swallow Falls. Swallow Falls State Park lies within Garrett State Forest. Scientific forestry in Maryland began in 1906 when two brothers from Baltimore, John and Robert Garrett, donated 2,000 acres of forest land to the state with the stipulation that a wildlife and forestry management program be initiated. In 1930, the Garrett donation was combined with other tracks to form Swallow Falls, now Garrett State Forest. Sentinel Rock, Swallow Falls. A 1912 Muddy Creek Falls postcard. The sender writes, this is so much preferred to Bible study and classes. So cool and delightful and everybody's happy. Come join us. An early painted postcard view of Muddy Creek. Muddy Creek has its source in the Cranesville Swamp and gets its name from the brackish waters found there. The creek eventually empties into the Yakagini River. Muddy Creek Falls is located within Swallow Falls State Park and at 64 feet is the largest waterfall in Maryland. In 1918, and again in 1921, three giants of American industry camped beside these falls. Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, and Harvey S. Firestone, Sr. Backbone Mountain, elevation 3,095 feet. This highway monument on Route 50 between Red House and Gorman was placed in 1928 by the Maryland State Roads Commission and identifies this spot as the highest point on the Maryland State Roads system. 
Just across the road from the Highway Memorial stands the ruins of a once popular spot known as the Table Rock Inn. The Table Rock Inn from a photograph taken around 1939. Here we are, the Table Rock Inn, featuring a Bosch and Lom telescope at the Overlook. Meals, rooms, cabins, and cold beer. The Table Rock Inn, famous for its second floor dining room. Though not certain, it is believed the inn was constructed sometime after World War I and torn down in the early 1970s. A very early 1900s canoe scene on the Castleman River. A 1911 depiction of the Yakagani River as taken from the county bridge in Oakland. 1912, the raging Yakagani, another scene near Oakland. In the Allegheny Mountains. Chimney Corner, located near the intersection of US Route 50 and US Route 219 at Red House. Chimney Corner was built in 1932 by Amos Peters, and he purposely constructed it to convey a rustic image. This photo advertises restrooms in the rear, ice-cold beer and ale, T-bone steaks, country ham, fried chicken, and a first aid station, which I hope had nothing to do with the food. The great fireplace inside the Chimney Corner. Built in 1932 and opened as a restaurant in 1933, the Chimney Corner was a popular night spot because of its entertainment and dancing. In 1939, the emphasis began to be on food. During this period, between the years 1942 to 1945, with food and gas rationing in effect during World War II, Chimney Corner was open mainly at night. The following photographs of the Wisp, most likely from the early 1970s, were taken by Ruth Van Morrow. It was in 1955, however, that Helmut Heiss and several businessmen began to transform Marsh Mountain, a cow pasture owned by a local farmer, into a makeshift ski area. Skis were rented from the back of a pickup truck. In 1958, a lift is added to replace the original rope tow, and by 1959, only Heiss holds to the dream of developing the area as a winter resort. He operates the ski area alone. Between 1959 and 1965, the Wisp develops into a bustling ski resort. The ski lodge continually expands to handle the growing number of skiers. 1971. The Village Inn, a 48-room motel owned by William Thoman, is constructed at the base of the slopes near the ski lodge. Over the next eight years, more double chair lifts and slopes are added, bringing the total number of trails to 16. By 1985, the Wisp Resort Hotel, a $50 million recreation and convention center began development. And by 1990, a new ski lodge, 23 trails, eight lifts and tows, which can accommodate 9,000 skiers per hour, condos, and a resort complex, including 167 hotel rooms and an 18-hole golf course, now characterized the Wisp where, in 1955, a one-room hut with a potbelly stove served as the ski lodge. Do you remember Dave Gunter's Guntertown Ski Lodge, just 18 miles west of Cumberland? The summer cottages of Guntertown, located just off US Route 40. It's 1930, and we're on the road to Friendsville, only 36 miles from Cumberland, and 176 miles to Baltimore. 1938, still traveling on the Friendsville Road with Bear Creek running alongside. The Cove along the Oakland Road, Route 219 near Kaiser's Ridge. With an elevation of between 2,800 and 3,100 feet, the Cove Overlook still presents a panoramic view of one of the finest farming districts in the area. A 1929 view depicting the historic Red House on U.S. Route 50. 
built sometime between 1884 and 1890 by Christian Martin, this building succeeded the old Red House Tavern and Inn, which served travelers along the old Northwestern Turnpike, now U.S. Route 50, which crossed southern Garrett County east to west. A stone house currently stands on this site. A photograph postmarked 1910 depicting the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad 17-mile grade, beginning at Piedmont, West Virginia, and continuing to Altamont, Maryland, the grade rises 1,626 feet in 17 miles for an average rise per mile of 95 feet. In places, the rise per mile is 116 feet, and this became the maximum grade for railroad construction. A wonderful 1910 view of the grade's B&O Viaduct at Bloomington. Construction of the grade took place between the years 1851 and 1852. The route of the B&O line was actually designed and selected in the 1840s by engineers under the direction of Benjamin H. Latrobe, chief engineer of the B&O, which was the largest railroad in America at that time. The railroad route and grade helped connect the Port of Baltimore to the Ohio Valley. A 1917 postcard depiction of Sampson's Rock on Big Savage Mountain Elevation, 2,942 feet. On January 13, 1964, a nuclear-laden United States Air Force B-52 bomber crashed in Garrett County at the foot of snow-swept Big Savage Mountain. The giant eight-engine bomber had a crew of five, only two of which would survive. This monument on U.S. Route 40, east of Grantsville, was erected to honor those area citizens who assisted the air and ground rescue teams in recovering the victims of the crash. The memorial, placed by Mountain District American Legion, also pays tribute to the bomber crew in the United States Air Force. The famous Rock Lodge off Rock Lodge Road on Meadow Mountain, about one and one half miles from Deep Creek Lake, is a one-story dwelling built of native sandstone. The lodge was constructed in 1919 as the mountain retreat for Frank F. Nicola, producer of mail pouch tobacco. Rock Lodge burned in 1928, but was rebuilt as identical as possible to the original structure. This photograph is from about the early 1920s. Eagle Rock, from a postcard dated 1912. Located three and one half miles southeast from Deer Park, Eagle Rock, at an elevation of 3,160 feet, provides a panoramic view of the surrounding countryside. During the area's heyday as a summer resort, visitors would often travel here by horse and buggy to take in the view. An early 1900s view of the State Road at McHenry, Maryland. The community of McHenry is located on the Buffalo Marsh Inlet of Deep Creek Lake. It is named after Dr. James McHenry of Baltimore, who served as an aide to General George Washington during the Revolutionary War. McHenry also served as Secretary of War from 1796 to 1800, and historic Fort McHenry in Baltimore is named in his honor. Dr. McHenry vacationed in this area during the summers and in 1810 purchased 444 acres of a tract of land called Locust Tree Bottom, which included the Buffalo Marsh and Cherry Tree Meadows sites. The settlement which followed here soon took McHenry's name. The Brandt Coal Mine, located in present-day Deep Creek Lake State Park, was a typical family-operated coal mine utilized and mined solely for the purpose of heating local homes. It was operated between the years 1923 to 1926 by two local men, George Beckman and Delphia Brandt. After only three years of working the coal mine, both men acquired silicosis, a disease of the lungs acquired from breathing sandstone dust. By 1927, both men had died. The original mine shaft went back into Meadow Mountain about 500 feet. 
It contained a two-foot vein of bituminous coal, a ton of which sold for about $2 in 1925. The Johnson Farm, located on the National Road just four miles west of Frostburg, on the western slope of Little Savage Mountain. Through the 19th century and well into the 20th, this land was owned by the Johnson family. Early tax records show that Thomas Johnson, Maryland's first governor from 1777 to 1779, and his descendants had large land holdings in this region. This house, located on the Johnson farm, was built sometime between 1872 and 1876, with its mansard roof, elaborate Victorian trim, and vertical board and batten siding, it remains one of the finest rural Victorian houses in Garrett County. In March 1971, Garrett Community College consisted of three buildings still under construction on a cleared meadow in McHenry. By September of that same year, the buildings were completed and eight faculty members welcomed the first class of students. The Governor Thomas Scenic Overlook is located on Savage River Road. Francis Thomas served as governor of Maryland from 1842 until 1845. He spent his retirement years on a farm near here until 1876 when he was struck and killed by a train while crossing the tracks of the b and Railroad near his home. The Maryland Manual states that Francis Thomas died at Frankville, a Garrett County railroading community that had been named in honor of the governor. The first Methodist Episcopal Church in what later became known as Hoy's was a simple log structure erected in 1855. In 1877, the log church was replaced by the current Hoy's United Methodist Church, depicted in this photograph. This small wooden frame building is typical of many of Garrett County's religious structures. In 1837, a post office was established in the community we know today as Sang Run. Prior to that time, the area had been known as the Sanging Ground after the plant ginseng, which grew abundantly in this area and which was a chief source of trade for the area's early pioneer settlers. This is Friends General Merchandise Store at Sang Run. It's the oldest country store in Garrett County and at various times also served as the community post office. Although the Sang Run Post Office was discontinued in 1972, the Friends Store still serves as a broker and shipper of that rare Garrett County root ginseng, which is widely noted for its longer and livelier life-giving qualities. More specifically, ginseng serves as a strengthener and restorative to the human body by balancing the body's metabolic equilibrium, particularly after periods of physical or mental exertion. Sang Run has been the ginseng capital of the world since 1769. The Savage River takes its name, according to legend, from John Savage. Savage was a member of a survey party in 1736. The party soon found themselves in dire straits and were actually considering eating poor John, who was the weakest and least worthy member of the group due to his poor eyesight. Fortunately, the group was rescued and they named the river in John's honor. Out of guilt, we suppose. The Savage River was the site of the 1989 World Whitewater Canoe and Kayak Championships held from June 11th to June 25th of that year. This photograph depicts one of the many volunteers during that event. These are my little girls, Natasha and Joe Cinda. Now be a girls. That's the show, folks. I really hope that you enjoyed it. More than that, I hope that maybe you learned something. I also know what you're thinking. He left a lot of things out of this. Well, you're probably right, and hopefully I'll pick it up in the next videotape. In the meantime, stay tuned because I'm gonna roll the credits, and there are a lot of people who I'm gonna identify who helped me in one way or another into making this videotape a reality. Again, thank you very, very much. Thank you.